Hello, I'm Dr. Stephen Hassan, and welcome to the Influence Continuum. I am absolutely honored to have an old colleague and friend, Joseph Zinhart, start over. I'm honored to have an old colleague and friend, Joseph Zimhart, with me here today. Uh, Joe and I go back to, what, 1986, Joe? Um, yes. In fact, you were you spoke in the famous video that's gone viral of the support group meeting uh, in Kansas City in 1986, where Jenny Thomas spoke about being in, in Life Spring. In fact, thank you for pointing out to me it was not 1989, it was 1986. And you said, I'll never forget it. It was my first conference. Yeah. <laughs> right. But uh, Joe, for our listeners, um, you know, let me just say that I have such a high regard for your intelligence. You're an avid reader and reviewer of books. Your, your knowledge is encyclopedic. Um, and I wanted to ask you to do this with me today to flesh out more about um, traditionalists and maybe about Opus Dei and Catholicism and just what's been happening in your research with the I Am movement. And of course, uh, I know you were involved with the Church Universal and Triumphant. I'm going to ask you to do a brief introduction, if you don't mind, Joe. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Steve. And uh, I don't know how encyclopedic I am about other things, but about the cult problem, <laughs> I've, I've taken a deep dive, as you have. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, my background, uh, again, I was born in 1947, so that dates me, and, and uh, my early history influences how I think now about cults, and, you know, I'm an immigrant from a displaced persons camp, and my family came here when I was three years old, they were Hungarian refugees, so they lost everything in the war to two totalitarian regimes, they were pinched between the, the Axis and then the communists came into Hungary and they just, you know, especially my mother's side of the family lost everything to the communists. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I got curious about alternative religion after uh, uh, life growing up as a Catholic, I was an altar boy and I, I recited the mass in Latin. So it goes way back then. Um, and so I went through the Vatican II changes in college. And as a result, the church went into a whole uh, uh, paroxysm uh, regarding uh, what Catholicism meant back there in the late 60s. And I bailed out of the church. I started looking into other things. Uh, William Blake's uh, interest in Swedenborg's theosophy, and that led to uh, more esoteric teachings like Madame Blavatsky and um, Manly P. Hall. And so by 1975, I was looking into the more esoteric parts of metaphysics and religion. And I came across the I am activity in Santa Fe, New Mexico, when I moved there within a month. Mm -hmm. And I got to know them. I got to know an older woman who was one of the early members, and she lent me all the books to read and talk to me whenever I wanted to. Um, I was working for her son as a uh, construction uh, handyman. And he owned a complex that used to be owned by the I am movement. Uh, so that led me to um, also looking into a group called Agni Yoga that was founded by the Russian uh, mystic Nicholas Rorich. He was also a famous painter and his wife, Helena, who was a channeler of ascended mm -hmm. beings, El Moria being the, or Moria being the main uh, character that she channeled. And I read all these Agni Yoga books, which I was, I was most interested in that part of theosophy. I got to know the Agni Yoga people in, in New York. There's a Rurich Museum there, and the Agni Yoga Society meets there. Uh, and then I met people that were in Church Universal and Triumphant, and I had known them, but they kept that side of themselves secret because it was weird, and they knew other people thought it was weird. But when they found out I was reading I Am and uh, Agni Yoga, they said that their group combined both teachings. And they had a thing called the Chiel in the Path they gave me, which says they were combining the I am and the Agni Yoga teachings and new dispensation. So I was already in mm -hmm. without knowing it because I was studying these two things at the time in 1978. And I went to three of the conferences, uh, Church Universal and Triumphant. Um, 
The last one I went to in 1980, I, I was a participant observer. I started doubting the whole thing and I was wondering what is going on here, you know, because right. I had gotten so deep in that, that I was willing to leave my then wife and my daughter to join the staff on this group. That's how deep I had psychologically gotten into it. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, after I was divorced, um, I began to question it more. And I started, um, I had panic attacks thinking about leaving, mm -hmm. you know, for about a month. I mean, it would wake me up in the middle of the night because I was, as you know, you caught in between what's real and what's not. And the answers don't come easy. Um, yeah, but I, I, I just want to add that phobia indoctrination is a mm -hmm. common cult technique to make you afraid to ever question or leave the group. Terror. Oh, yeah. Th th this group was uh, saturated with new thought as well as theosophy, which means, you know, you always think positive. You never doubt your beliefs or whatever there is. In fact, doubt was considered uh, a dark force. Uh, or satanic and uh, if you left the group you would um, your chances for ascension would be rescinded for about 10,000 lifetimes they oh, believe 10,000 yeah, not right. too bad you know <laughs> oh god uh, you could wait that out um, so <laughs> so all of that you're right the phobia indoctrination was pretty heavy and uh, once I got through that and I wanted to, I, I began to read anew things I had read before that were critical of the group Yep. And it was like I had new eyes and, yep. and I started to just drink this stuff in. I, you know, I came across uh, Snapping by Conway and Siegelman, which was the first book I read about the cult problem. And, you know, and it was helpful. Yeah, um, I came out in 78, I believe. 78, 79. I had a 1979 edition. Of course, it was 1980 when I read it. Uh -huh. And I started talking to ex-members from CUT, including Gregory Mull um, and uh, Marilyn Malik, whose son was still in it, got to know her very well. She was the go-to person about anti-cult material back then. And she um, introduced me to Dr. Singer, who I met in Berkeley uh, at her house in 1982. She wanted to interview me because she had an upcoming court case to testify on a CUT case. If I can interject, so yeah. Margaret Singer was an army psychologist who studied yeah. Chinese communist brainwashing along with Robert J. Lift and Edgar Schein and Lewis West. And she uh, is deceased, unfortunately, but has written mm -hmm. a number of books with Jan Jolalich, like Cults in Our Midst. And Margaret actually wrote the foreword to the original combating book right, uh, that right. I published. But, but yeah. You, I want to also not forget to acknowledge you're such a talented artist. Yeah, well. I don't want people just thinking your whole life is about cults and helping people to wake up and reevaluate them. But you have a career and you're a very talented artist and you've written a novel and you've written mm -hmm. a memoir as well um, that I want to point people to. Uh, we did a blog with you with, that right. has links and we'll, we'll do a blog on this. But back to your story, you met Margaret Singer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, I, I had a relationship with her off and on until she passed away, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, I, when I met her, I didn't realize how important she was in the uh, so-called anti-cult movement at the time, because she was really helping a lot of people and on volunteer time very often in that, especially at the time, uh, that group sorting it out in San Francisco, it was set up by Josh Barron, I think, and others. Yes, uh, my friend Josh Barron, who yeah. was in a Zen Buddhist cult. Exactly. Exited. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh -huh. so um, I think she she uh, gathered a lot of uh, uh, primary information for her research on the current cult problem back then mm -hmm. with those uh, sessions she did with ex-members, um, thousands of them she worked with. Yeah, and yeah. I want to just circle back and say one more, a couple more things about Church Universal and Triumphant since you were involved with that. So people uh, of our age will may remember that she prophesied Russia was going to nuke us and was building bomb shelters in Montana. And one of her daughters left the group and there was actually an Oprah Winfrey show mm -hmm. with one daughter who was still in and and one that was out. I was actually on that. And I think I remember the show is on YouTube still. But uh 
you know, I reached out to you um, a, a couple of years ago as I was doing a research on QAnon and I am was like on a lot of tweets threads mm -hmm. and I was talking with Dave Troy and some other colleagues and I was like, J we got to talk to Joe. <laughs> and, and so you've been at my request saying, Joe, do videos like on all these topics, please, because your knowledge is so uh important for people mm -hmm. to unpack what has been happening currently back to you yeah yeah the old i am movement um uh one of the things that attracted me to cut was they they claimed that um helena rorich who is the wife of nicholas rorich passed away in 1955 was reincarnated as tatiana the youngest daughter of uh elizabeth prophet and mark prophet and so my curiosity was, you know, what would it feel like to meet the reincarnation of this famous woman who I'd been reading about and reading her works uh -huh. for so long? Uh, you know, so that that little personal connection, uh, I wanted to go out to a conference to get an idea. What would that feel like in person, you know, mm -hmm. to see a kid that's supposedly reincarnated? Right. Um, but but in any case, um, and, and they gave her a, a Russian name knowing that's what they believed she was, you know, coming into uh, uh, incarnation this time. Of course, the Agni Yoga people dispute that. They claim that uh, Helena ascended. She didn't have to come back again. And so you have uh, these inter, um, uh, you know, these fights within theosophy. I mean, there's constant conflicts within those kinds of movements about who's really channeling who and and uh, who's the real messenger and, and whose truth is the truth. And I mean, it's, it's, that's partly what drove me out of it. I, I just, you know, the I am didn't like cut, cut didn't like Agni Yoga. Agni Yoga said cut was ripping off the material, you know, and I kept hearing this stuff because I was bouncing around among these groups. There was a uh, Torkum Sari Darian, who was a theosophist in Malibu foothills. Uh, he promoted the Alice Bailey and Blavatsky and Rorich stuff, and he thought that Bro Elizabeth Prophet was a fake, and he told me that in person. You know, mm -hmm. I went to one of his meetings. So, right. you know, I was getting internal conflicts within the theosophical movement that wouldn't go away. Right, great. So, Joe, I want to I want to uh, cut to um, the the current state of affairs and. Uh, I, this this videotape uh, with Ginny Thomas talking about mm -hmm. life spring, her intense activism, helping to set up congressional briefings. We were working on cult awareness week, trying to pass that in honor of uh, 10 years uh, from Jonestown, where Congressman Ryan was assassinated and Ron Harris from NBC. And she was very active, at least from 86 to 92. And mm -hmm. I believe it was in 92 that she introduced me to Clarence Thomas at a uh, cult awareness meeting. Um, but then uh, what's happened to the Thomases? And uh, the question of whether or not Kevin Garvey, who was involved with her intervention with LifeSpring, might be involved with traditionalism and could you explain mm -hmm. a little bit more about what that's about yeah i did a uh, video uh, about it that i had been involved in traditionalism after cut and, and the reason was that the the main prophet if you want to call him that of traditionalism was rene guinon and he mm -hmm. lived until the 50s mm -hmm. uh, he was a frenchman who um who was in the Catholic uh, tradition and uh, explored as a young man, explored Freemasonry and, and Sufism right. and other things. And he got involved with theosophy for a while. And then uh, he decided that it was a pseudo religion. It wasn't a true tradition. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a book about theosophy as a pseudo religion and what he called the counter initiation. In other words, there's real traditional initiations into religion and there's false ones. Hmm. So, he he had he actually wrote a very uh, good critique of theosophy and it helped me i had to read it in french at that time because it wasn't in english until 2001 or two i believe wow that's impressive you well I I, I I i got enough french and a friend of mine who spoke fluent french helped me with it and, and i was able to gather what i needed from from the book but there was also um another quasi-traditionalist Mirce eliari who was the um professor of uh, religious studies at uh, 
University of Chicago, and, and he started the, you know, something called the History of Religions, which wasn't known at the time. Mm -hmm. And I was impressed with Eliade, and Eliade had talked a lot about Gwinnon in some of his writings, and that's how I learned about him. So uh, this traditionalism, basically what, what it says is that there's some kind of perennial wisdom out there that, that can be tapped by certain people, meaning that it's the basis of all religion and philosophy. Uh, Pythagoras was thought to have tapped into that somehow huh. back in when, you know, so he's one of the keys to this kind of thinking, uh, Pythagorean wisdom. Um, the other key is that, that you have to belong to some tradition so you can and be initiated into it. And so that could be anything. It could be the Hindu religion. It could be in Islam through Sufism. It could be through ultra Catholicism. It could be through Orthodox Judaism. In other words, tradition is 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 masked by the very mis mystical aspects of of the core of any tradition. For instance, the Kabbalah and Judaism would fit into the traditional sort of ideas. So now you're getting into occultism, into esotericism with this. Right. And it tends to be hidden behind the scenes. You know, it's kind of the, the, the idea that you can be a Mason, but you don't tell people. You can be a traditionalist and a Hindu, but you don't tell people. Mm -hmm. um, Gwinnon went to the Hindu scriptures to develop his traditionalism. And he believed in something called, you know, the four stages of man. Uh, and we're in the Kali Yuga stage right now, which means to him, it meant the reign of quantity, meaning that we are getting more and more materialistic and drifting away from quali quality, which is what tradition is. In other words, metaphysical quality of life. Mm. The, 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 and, uh, and so he was a, a critic of modernism. Mm -hmm. And so now you're, you could see where fundamentalism also matches this because Gwinnon began to criticize modernism back in the 20s and 30s. And you see Amer you know, Christian fundamentalism rising up at that time. You know, the mm -hmm. fundamentalists were, were uh, and so this this kind of a reaction to modernism is really what's part of this whole movement of, um, you know, that we're looking at. Going back to Kevin Garvey, who helped Ginny Thomas uh, exit Lifespring, um, I knew Kevin, Kevin quite well, and we had quite a few talks, and he was a, a, a traditionalist in the sense, not of Gwinnon, but in the sense of Catholicism pre-Vatican II with the idea that Thomas Aquinas is really the core of, of what Catholics should be believing. And he was a, a Thomist in his approach. He, he wasn't a practicing Catholic, but, but he, in his mind, he was more Catholic than the priests were, you know, in that sense. And he had a, a visceral um, sense of uh, good and evil. He felt evil was a real tangible kind of a thing, you know, as opposed to a psychological problem that we have, uh, you know, how we see the world. You know, so Kevin was complicated. He helped a lot of people out of groups. And, and by the way, I know, and you and I both know, he, he had some tension with you and, and some of your ideas. Yeah, he threatened However, to throw me out of a window while he was blowing <laughs> cigarette smoke in my face. Uh, Kevin could be temperamental. Yeah. But... He did tell me later on that he really appreciated your book, Combat He Caught My Control. So news uh, to me, but the, yeah, thanks, but he Kevin. did. He did, and he uh, he did pass it out to his uh, clients. Mm -hmm. You know, so unexpected. It, but thank you for that. But right, um, right, and I thought you'd like to hear that. But he told me that personally. We were sitting around talking, and uh, this was later. You know, uh, so. These things are complex. They're not as right. Uh, yeah. Let's. Can I ask you to opine about uh, Putin now and Dugin and the what appears to be a version, to me at least, of traditionalism that. Happened? Yeah, and 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 it's a, a version because there's many versions of it. Right. Um, you know, so Gwinnon was the 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 prophet of it. So let's say, but but there were. Even his followers split off in many different directions to establish their own forms of traditionalism based on his ideas. Mm -hmm. So Alexander Dugan, when he was younger, college age, along parallel to Steve Bannon, they both were influenced by reading Guinan's um, uh, uh, monograph about Hinduism and, and how he interpreted this, this form of tradition. It changed them. Both of them said that. It was a 
changing thing in their lives to have uh, read Guinan's work. Mm -hmm. um, Dugan applied it, came to apply it to Russian Orthodoxy, seeing that the tradition is in Russia is within the Orthodox Church because it represents this, this um, spirit that can lead to the ultimate perennial wisdom within Russian society. Mm -hmm. And and he, uh, you know, became sort of uh, the guru whispering in Putin's ear about what this meant. And, and of course, this excites Putin because he's an ultranationalist. Right. And and traditionalism does feed into ultranationalism. So Putin and Dugan may not have agreed on everything, but this is certainly uh, a, a lot of the, the neo-Eurasianism that that uh, Dugan was promoting, especially since 1997 in that book he released, mm -hmm. um, drives a lot of Putin's ideas of how the world works. And for instance, uh, Russia was gonna be the new Rome, like the ancient Roman empire. And the, the code word for the United States and NATO and all that is Carthage in that type of thing. And of course, Rome was fighting Carthage and had to dominate that in order to create the Pax Romana. So, you know, th th this is all kind of silly mythology in the brain acting out. But as you and I both know, beliefs can drive behaviors. 100%. Right. And so that's what's going on with this kind of traditionalism, I think, behind Putin is that this belief that comes from on high from perennial wisdom is driving a lot of his behavior because he feels uh, he's being uh, validated by God or the universe or however you want to you know, history itself, for instance. Mm -hmm. yeah. And correct me if I'm wrong, but the Vatican II, I think it was 1962, um, there was a big backlash by traditionalists against, you know, changing the mass from being in Latin. Oh, yeah. And uh, say, say a little bit about, about that. And was it uh, Archbishop Marcel Favre? Who was excommunicated? Father, yeah. It started the Society of Saint Pius the Saint Pius the Tenth. Yeah, that's yeah. the main one. Uh, you know, by the way, Mel Gibson's father was part of that too. That kind of uh, mm -hmm. old traditional Catholicism, the Latin Mass thing. Uh huh. Um, I, you know, even um, getting back to Garvey, yep. this this right. ties into this. Kevin introduced me to a, a, a brilliant guy, Rama Kumar Swami. Mm. And Rama was a surgeon and uh, quite a good medical doctor, later got interested in metaphysics and also became a, like a psychoanalyst or a psychiatrist in his later life. But he was a traditionalist. And in the sense that his father, um, Ananda Kumar Swami, was already a published traditionalist, uh, quite a well-known writer, you know, part Indian and... Uh, and uh, uh, along with Eliade and a few others, Kumar Swami Ananda helped to spread this idea that, that there was uh, some kind of a perennial truth behind the, behind the great myths and behind the great religions, whatever. Uh, they weren't as radical as went on, however. Mm -hmm. um, so I met Rama one day with Kevin Garmi. He introduced me to him uh, thinking that I might enjoy his whatever polemic. Um, Rama was a pre-Vatican II Catholic. He converted because, not because he, he, he uh, you know, he had a mix of Hindu and other background in, in him, but he felt he needed a tradition that he could be initiated in in order to be a true traditionalist, you know, which is what Gwinnon's theory was. So that's why uh -huh. he converted to Catholicism, not because he was a normal Catholic. Right. It was more metaphysical. And so he... Rama had a lot of interaction with Mother Teresa. They, they wrote letters. Hmm. When he came out against Vatican II, Mother Teresa and him parted ways because she promote, she supported you know, the changes in the church and he did not. Mm -hmm. um, so he became part of that movement and one of the more important uh, voices, I think, at the time uh, because he had such intellectual weight as a person um, within that traditionalist uh, view. But I didn't, I never got to talk to him very deeply about it. Um, I think uh, like most traditionalists, they kind of kept things close to the chest until they really trusted you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I wasn't um, uh, vetted 
enough to be taken into his confidence completely back in that day. Yeah, the uh, lack of transparency is always a giveaway that there's something, some secrets. That are yeah, you know, it's the idea that, you know, don't cast your pearls before swine, right? That you, That's used uh, constantly in cults. Yes, and uh, so he's used that one mm -hmm. constantly as well. Right, so you can weaponize those kind of slogans either way. You know. But I wanted to mention another colleague uh, that goes back uh, many, many decades, Kent Bertner, who was Father uh, yeah. Bertner when I first met him. He kindly consented to an interview with me about the schism that's occurred in the Catholic Church, where these traditionalist-oriented folks are thinking the Pope is satanic. Oh, yeah. You know, and they, you know, and God isn't in, you know... <laughs> When the Pope says we have to help the poor and we have to take care of our climate, you know, they think this is Satan talking. I think um, oh, it's driven by two things. You know, one is um, there's people like Escriva who didn't like the changes. And, and, founded and Opus Dei. Founded Opus Dei, right, in Spain. And, uh, um, you know, he... But by dint of his character and personality, he was a hardcore Catholic. He wanted to, he believed in good and evil in almost visceral ways. He believed in penance mm -hmm. and developed different kind of uh, penances that you could do as an Opus Dei member. And he also developed a kind of a secret society. In other words, similar to traditionalism, Opus Dei people don't announce that they're an Opus Dei. Almost like the early Birchers, uh, John Birch Society, they would become part of the Birch Society, but wouldn't let people know they were part of the society and they kept it close to the chest, you know, until, as usual, information does leak out because there's always ex-members and then they start blowing whistles and, you know, the whole story. Yeah, I love those ex-member whistleblower types, <laughs> for sure. Um, yeah. I want to just mention that when I was researching the cult of Trump, I learned that William Barr was on the board of directors of Opus Dei in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. I couldn't get any details more than that connection, but how do you be on a board of directors of Opus Dei without being at least you know, very involved? or trusted at the very least. And I want to mention also that William Barr, I learned later, was in charge of, uh, I think it was Robert Hansen, the Russian uh, counterterrorism FBI man. Uh, I, should, I said it the wrong way. Let me start over again. Um, let me just write down 57. Um, so what I understood was that uh, the, the biggest spy ever exposed in American intelligence was actually a member of Opus Dei, Robert Hansen. And William Barr was actually in charge of, of uh, his disposition and said, no, 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 he had nothing to do with Opus Dei, which goes completely opposite everything I know about Opus Dei or Robert Hansen in future years whenever anyone wanted to talk with him. Yeah, I, I think you have to be careful. Um, you know, these groups like the Birchers and, and others have layers of membership. Yep. And, um, and, and people on the board might be interested in support some of the truths or the impulses that are in the group, but m maybe they're involved in big business and are anti-communist, let's say, or whatever. And that's why they're put on a board. I, so I, I don't know. I don't know enough so about it. Might it might be all mixed I'm interests versus actually right. thinking Escrivo was a great saint. Uh, yeah. We should say Opus Dei is an official prelature of the Catholic Church. To this yes, day. and 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 uh, John Paul II uh, sanctified, uh, beatified uh, Escrivo. Yeah, which is very strange. In fact, you know, he 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 was making saints quite uh, readily while he was a. Uh, alive uh you know doing things that a lot of people questioned as far as you know rushing people into sainthood it's kind of like appointing uh supreme court judges when you're in office you know so right <laughs> so let's let's come back for a minute and just opine with the federalist society and six of nine supreme court justices mm -hmm. Uh, that were installed with with Democratic as well as Republican presidents, I should add. Um, you know much about the Federalist Society or the politics? 
Yeah, I mean, I know it leans right. I don't, you know, I'm not up on it. I can't say I'm, a, a, okay. you know, but I, I maybe you could uh, say something about it that might help trigger me. <laughs> well, just Leonard Leo, uh, the, it, it seems like decades ago, a group of people said, we've got to stop this liberal trend going on. And we need to think about creating institutions and identifying good candidates to, to go to become judges and to, to uh, be, you know, get on the Supreme Court. Why? Because yeah. it's one branch of the U.S. government that's very important. Mm -hmm. I think uh, this has been going on, especially since the 20s. I mean, you see this pressure to bring the United States into... A, a Christian nation, so to speak, is one of the pushes that we're losing that. And again, it's 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 um, it's a struggle against modernism. And a lot of the ultra conservatives identify modernism with um, elitism in the academies of the universities, and also with communism that that, that wants to get rid of God. Um, you know, it's a simplistic way to look at modernism, but but it works. It, it does fire up the base, and uh, you know they they set up a very clean us and them movement as a result of uh, yeah. But of people that. like Bannon think nothing of using high tech to manipulate people's minds, you know, digitally because it you know serves the agenda. Yeah. yeah, it's modernism more is about ideas than technology, I think, in their minds. And, uh, you know, the the whole, for instance, just the idea of uh, examining the, the Bible itself through hermeneutics and science and archaeology and all of that, it violates their faith, mm -hmm. they believe. And uh, uh, so... You know that that divide has has become much more apparent. But but you could, you know, I'm reading this book on um, called uh, a conspiratorial life about uh, Robert Welch, the founder of the Birchers, and the book really covers a lot of this history uh, from the 40s and 50s. Of mm -hmm. you know, we're still mired in it. In yep. this this screaming about uh, the left and socialism and and you know the way the Fabian socialists, for instance, in the 19th century, they had the idea that that you could, that socialism would creep into society. You would just keep working it, working it, working it, and then the conspiracy people keep pointing out, look, they're working it here, they're working it there. You know, they're they're trying to uh, better race relations. That's a form of communism to them. You know, it's it's not happening naturally as opposed to uh, you know, uh, people uh, uh, picketing and, and changing laws and whatever it is to get society in a more healthier framework, they see it as creeping socialism. Yep. And uh, so that's where the conspiracy idea comes in, is that any move that we make toward helping the poor, helping the elderly is seen as communism. Yeah, but they also were pretty racist and wanting to steal oil from indigenous lands and 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 and, and pollution with at least with the coke folks that were Yeah, it was a kind of uh, you know, you can look at Australia as a small version of what happened in the United States with the aboriginals down there and the reason that the colonists, the British felt that they could take the land was that they said that the people that lived there didn't have a concept of owning land and they didn't work it the way we were going to work it so they were just hunter gatherers and therefore they didn't they didn't deserve to own it so they morally they saw it was okay to take it from them however recent research shows that the aboriginals had claimed the land but in their own way they were able to irrigate it they were able to manage it they had little you know they actually managed a lot of the land much better than the colonists did because the colonists came and created deserts where there weren't any before in places yep. there you know, so, so, you know, it, it's, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy to say that we are a superior race. Uh, you guys are just a little bit advanced from the apes and we can take your land. And yeah, I think- we have uh, guns, so we're going to, we're going to yeah. kidnap your kids, put them in residential schools and try to brainwash them to be good little Christians. Yeah, we were going to make them better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, 
So um, I'd be remiss, Joe, to not ask you to talk a little bit more about LifeSpring and large group awareness trainings. Like Clarence Thomas's wife, Jenny, was involved with LifeSpring. That's yeah. how she came to that uh, counter, um, you know, to, 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 to come to uh, cult awareness work. Yeah, the, 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 they call them large group awareness trainings or mass therapies. Uh, there's all kinds of words for it. And it came uh, partly out of uh, the, the, the encounter group therapies that happened in the 50s and 60s. And, and I think also um, Zen ideas of, uh, of, you know, and some Scientology got mixed in. But but there was this guy, William Penn Patrick, who had a group called Holiday Magic. It was like a multi-level marketing thing. And he had these trainings that he set up to train his salesmen. Uh, among them was Werner Earhart and uh, Hanley and, and uh, Will Height, who began Cyworld, yep. which is the most expensive early um, uh, mass training for executives. Mm -hmm. uh, he charged an enormous amount of money for his weekends. And... Uh, uh, but Werner Erhard, uh, Jack Rosenberg, who changed his name to a German name, Werner Erhard. Yep, and he uh, left his wife and kids, and yeah. Yeah, yeah, big history there. But he became, uh, founded S, E S T, which means being, you know. And so he combined his Zen insights with a lot of other things, and he created these kind of brutal, in some ways, mass yes. therapy trainings during the weekend to get at your essential self, get rid of your old false beliefs, right. to strip them away. You know, so he came up with a lot of sayings like you are perfect in the moment, whatever that means. In other words, if you're murdering someone, you're perfect in the moment. And that's what it really it extends into that kind of craziness. And yeah, there's no such thing as a victim either. No, right? so no. If you uh our friend carol who spoke also at that support group recording mm -hmm. it was great to see you and her so many years ago of course i had black hair at yeah, the time did. but they were telling her when she was an s that she created her own diabetes mm -hmm. and made her feel guilty to find figure out why did she create this terrible disease and of course yeah it's just nonsense so what um, LifeSpring, uh, well, by the way, S became Landmark Corporation in the forum later because they were right. sued so many times. And these mass therapy groups, including LifeSpring, would settle out of court continually and settle for hush money right. because it was bad for business. Right. You know, and 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 they just they had an incredible recruiting machine because they had everybody that went through the program go out and recruit more people. And then they could come take the program again for free, so to speak. But they were like, um, like plants that showed other people how to behave, you know. And it was hundred percent. And then the, the advanced yeah. and the other advanced and the other seminar, oh, yeah. the other seminar, and then the hunger project. We can solve world hunger by if everyone just believes that we can you think it away. Yeah. yeah, like the Maharishi uh, meditating it away. Right. You know that kind of thing. So. Uh, what was interesting about Est and those kinds of movements, the, the critics were saying things like, which is one of my favorite critical sayings was, you went into Est with normal problems and you came out the other end obnoxious. <laughs> you know, the idea was that the people that went through it were so excited by it because they left you on and up. Everybody was hugging each other and you got to go out and show people how wonderful this is. That, that most people that were, you know, would, would want to talk to you if you were a graduate of them, because that's all you talked about. And, right. and, you know, you said, you're annoying, get away from me. You know? so yeah, that the I'm, members were made to feel guilty if they weren't successful at being oh, yeah. their friends. They, they weren't committed to their transformation and they weren't committed mm -hmm. enough to save the world. So it's heavy guilt trip manipulation. Too. Yeah, and, and of course, this large group awareness training led to life coaching. A lot of life coaches borrowed from these ideas. I mean, Tony Robbins yeah. is the most famous you know, of them and uh, using the same manipulative techniques in order to rile, rile people up. You know, he took them on fire walking to get over their fears. And even Oprah went on a fire walk with Tony Robbins about 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. He, he learned NLP <laughs> and made a deal with the founders of that to rebrand it so he could mm -hmm. make a lot of money. 
But uh, uh, there's a documentary, Tony Robbins, I Am Not Your Guru. If you yeah. want to see an example of modern day large group awareness trainings and what's wrong with them, check out that. I know it was okay. meant as a recruitment vehicle for him, but I, I think anybody who knows anything about mind control or cults or group dynamics would watch that going, ooh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's an awful lot of... Uh sloganeering in, in these groups, yep. uh, what we call thought terminating cliches yes. that keep you from criticizing the group. It's, it's, in, it's in invested in, in the whole system. So uh, it's very difficult to think your way out of that without some kind of reflection and information from the outside coming in. Yep. So we're going to wrap up in a minute, Joe. Um, all I can ask you to talk about is whatever you think we didn't cover that the listeners should know about and we will do a blog and put a lot of links to your books and to your video mm -hmm. channel but what else uh, do you want to end up with uh, to share well just to, you know i've been uh, working on this idea which might turn into a paper who knows of uh, using a wr beyond's ideas of basic assumption groups and extend that and how cults, why cults operate, why they even exist. And uh, I thought he did a pretty good analysis of group behavior and, and how when people fall into basic assumptions, they fall into dependencies because they want to protect their basic assumptions and fall into hmm. what he called uh, uh, flight, fright modes, uh, dependency on leader modes and, and pairing modes. And what the pairing mode is that if you in this closed system of, mm -hmm. of like cult behavior, yep. you want to breed within the cult in order to, the Moonies are a classic example of this, of the mass marriages. You want to yes. pair up and breed the super race or whatever it is, the super cult from within. That's one of the signs of, uh, of basic assumption neurosis. And uh, anyway, that's something I've been working on rather than uh, uh, you know, following some of the the other models that have been around. Yeah, and 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 to bring science back in, which is missing from all of these groups and their ideologies, um, people have almost the identical DNA. Like, there's such a, a minute mm -hmm. thing. Skin color, for example, is such a tiny fraction of the human experience, but. Some people, for ideological purposes, make it into a, you know, they're inferior, we're superior. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the case of the, uh, the colonization of ind uh, indigenous people's lands, it's like we're Christians and they're pagans. So we have a right, a divine right to take their property and use it for God. And they're mm -hmm. less than human beings unless we can convert them. To... Yeah, I think a, a lot of that, and maybe we can, it, it comes down to this thing called social Darwinism that crept into the thinking behind traditionalism and, and fundamentalism and all of that, that if, if God wills it, it'll happen. So if you win the war, even if you cheat and, and do genocide, the God must have willed it. Yes. And that, that to me is social uh, Darwinism that, that, you know, if, if you uh, cheat someone in a bargain, well, it wouldn't have happened if God didn't will it. Yeah, yeah. If someone gets lucky and, you know, invents a company and makes billions of dollars, you know, then it wasn't luck and it wasn't all the other people who worked with them to develop the company. Mm -hmm. It was because they were superior mm -hmm. and therefore, you know, they have the right to uh, infringe on other people's rights. Yeah, I think that's it. That's the bottom of this whole thing. You get this kind of egotistic narcissism that usually is the core of most cults. And uh, the idea that, that you know, the world out there is wounding our narcissism. We have a right to wound it back kind of idea. Yeah, and I just, I, I want to state on behalf of my friends who are who are Christians and, and, and conservative Christians, like for them, Jesus is their focus of their spirituality not dominionism taking over the government mm -hmm. you know uh making a fortune uh by promising prosperity if you know just put put all your money to us and we will god will you know make it tenfold and then when that doesn't happen it's people are told that they didn't have enough faith or they didn't 
confess that secret sin so they're mm -hmm. blamed but then these some of these um pre preachers are making millions and millions of dollars in many cases abusing sexually uh parishioners and there seems to be this ministerial exemption in the United States. Well, it's a religion. We got to give them a pass when, in fact, if it was a used car salesman, you know, selling cars with a bad odometer, they, they would, you know, it would be a criminal act. Right. Right. Yeah. And I think the, the, the other poison that's entered some of the uh, fundamentalist uh, realm is once saved, always saved mm -hmm. kind of exonerates a lot of behavior. And uh, that, that, needs to be talked about also at some point, I think, among that community. So, Great. Thank you so much, Joe. You've helped so many people. I am grateful to you and uh, continued good health and uh, keep writing. You have, uh, let's share your website. Uh, you have a lot of great material up there. Uh, what is the URL? for your website? Uh, it's just my name, Jay Simhart. You can see the spelling here, J-S-Z-I-M-H-E-R-T dot com. Yep. And that'll so, get you onto my artwork also. Yeah, very talented artwork. Thank you so much. Have a great thanks, day. Thanks, Steve. And continued success, Joe. You too. Take care. Okay, Bye -bye. thanks.